Good evening everyone, time for another member update. Now this is the gold silver uh, cross chart uh, on the weekly. You can see it goes back to the trend line start here around 2002, basically the beginning of the bull market, mid 2001 to 2002. You can see where they both turned up. The two trend lines I've drawn in here are the long-term trend lines and you can see that while silver has recently, as, as recently as January of this year, touched back to that long-term trend line, uh, which was touched back in the financial crisis in 2008, and we may be revisiting here, it's, the trend line is sitting at about a $14 price. So the, bottom, the downside um, danger for silver is about 14 bucks so we're talking about uh, not a very large percentage move or dollar move but gold on the other hand uh, we're sitting at about 900 bucks for the long-term trend line uh, so gold is very vulnerable here if we're talking about a comparison between the two for me 70 to 1 silver to gold with this trend line information tells me that silver is a much better buy um, we recently had uh, coverage, uh, I think it was Dave Kranzler, uh, maybe it was the Daily Coin, or uh, someone interview recently was talking about a missionary who had recently returned from Venezuela, and he said that you are now able to buy uh, six months of food with a silver dollar. Think about that. That's incredible. So... We see this time and time again. We're seeing it. We saw it recently in India that these things don't really matter until they do matter. Now, this chart here of the Venezuelan uh, currency is, you can see it, it's just gone parabolic again to the extent that it makes the past look uh, just n like nothing. And here we are, we're approaching we're going to be hitting that 5000 to the dollar. I don't know when we're going to reach that Zimbabwe point in Venezuela, the point where it just becomes a joke. They reached that in Zimbabwe. I think they reached a $1 trillion uh, note for the Zimbabwe dollar. And then it just it became so ridiculous that people just started using gold. They're actually panning for gold and using euros and dollars in Chinese currency and it was just there was no point anymore. Venezuela is getting very very close to that point and uh, we're going to be looking here in a second at Puerto Rico which in my opinion they're just absolutely doomed. Uh, it's my contention and it has been my contention for a very long time that there will be a bailout. I don't think there's any way out of this because there's uh, Wall Street isn't going to settle for the crash that could ensue if those bonds go under. But first I wanted to look at the cryptocurrencies here. You can see that we've got about a $21 billion market cap for the whole thing. If you remember, I used to cover it and it was it had hovered around $13 billion. Um, but Bitcoin's up here around $750. Bucks. You can see there's been some fairly dramatic moves in the alternatives. Now, uh, there's some talk about Bitcoin doing what Ethereum did, which is kind of splitting. You can see Ethereum, uh, 639 million market cap on Ethereum. And Ethereum Classic has a $63 million market cap, so about 10% there. There's a potential for Bitcoin doing a fork like that. I think it's a really bad idea. There's a lot of interviews you can listen to about uh, talking about this upcoming potential fork with Bitcoin. Basically, to explain it in a real simple way, uh, there are a group of people who want to add some more features or make changes to Bitcoin, and there is a certain percentage of people who don't want to. And that can cause a potential fork in the coin, which means that it basically becomes two separate blockchains that uh, fork, which is like a fork in the road, and uh, there's two separate paths. 
it basically becomes two separate coins. I think it's a bad idea because I think Bitcoin has served its purpose. And for me, Bitcoin's purpose is to prove to people that a cryptocurrency is a real uh, potential decentralized functional way of getting out of government fiat currency systems and using the private sector's own money. And Bitcoin has proven that. It's, it has defeated all uh, comers. Um, there are some potential problems, but in my opinion, why not leave that to the alternative cryptocurrencies to solve? Uh, I've recently taken down, you can see the link here for the Bitcoin channel. I've taken that down. It's too much work and uh, it just points over to Silver for the People now. It wasn't really making any money and it was losing a lot of traffic. And for me, it served its purpose because when I created that blog, there was nobody covering Bitcoin. Uh, since that time, it, there's just been a ton of people, Coinbase, many, many others. And my whole goal was just simply to make the world aware of this idea of a cryptocurrency and what its potential is. I think it succeeded in that mission and uh, I was one of the early adopters. I never get credit for that, but that's okay. And so now it's time to retire it. But I want to talk about some alternative cryptocurrencies here and the two that I'm looking at that maybe have some potential here. Uh, the first one is Steam. You can see here it's a $22 million market cap. I know Jeff Berwick jumped on that one early on and I did a video on it, but generally the rule you have to follow with these cryptocurrencies is that they're going to lose 99% of their initial value. That's just, that's the way it is. And when you see that number about 99%, I think, well, this one goes from we'll just say four down to point one. So what is that? A 98% loss, something like that. I think 50 to one, uh, 40. So big, big loss and sitting at $22 million market cap. Now this is basically the uh, cryptocurrencies answer to Facebook. And with the fake news, uh, issue coming out here if you're not up on that in my opinion basically the fake news thing is just the uh, the Clintons being sore losers and the Trump winning using the alternative media because that's how he did it uh, we covered him Alex Jones covered him uh, Andy Hoffman everybody in our alternative space covered Trump at least gave him a fair shake I wouldn't say we're all pro Trump but gave him a fair shake as opposed to the mainstream media and his own party and the other party were absolutely just out to get him and they lost and it it showed an incredible weakness in their system of control and so now they're coming out with this fake news thing where uh, it, it's the same sort of thing you see in science you see it in the universities you see it with the global warming thing they stifle debate by name calling it's essentially name calling and arguments from authority to completely bogus tactics of argument. Uh, basically, they're telling you that you can only listen to the people who they tell you <laughs> you can listen to. And of course, that's the people they control. So they're very desperate. I think they're going to lose. And we've seen that they've got Google on board, Facebook on board, Twitter on board. I would love to see uh, people abandon these sites and i think that steam maybe could be one that has that potential to uh, have that alternative to facebook we'll see another one that i'm looking at like i said i like to see other uh, cryptocurrencies besides bitcoin rather than uh, just having bitcoin uh, be modified and potentially forked because it doesn't have some of the features that people want. I would rather see someone come up with a new coin that does what people want it to do. Now, the other one I'm looking at here is Zcash. I played this one a couple of times, but it still seems to be on that big, big downtrend. Um, it's beyond 99% because it was at a premium to Bitcoin. It was trading at like $7,000 at one point. And you can see it's down to $47. Probably has a ways to go, but you can see we're finally getting some kind of bounce here in it. Um, but it, 
again looks like it's going to make new lows one to keep an eye on has definitely done its 99 percent move this one is basically something that allows you to use the features of bitcoin which is just the ability to send money instantly from one computer to any other computer anywhere else in the world regardless of borders but this one has the ability to hide your identity which is a neat feature that's added something that governments absolutely hate and loathe and the only thing i can say to them is too bad you lost math one so this is one that has potential for that uh, anonymity play whereas steam has the potential for the social media play just a couple that i'm watching definitely not recommending anything but keep an eye on them so let's get over to this main story here about puerto rico now i said for the longest time that puerto rico there's simply no way out of this situation and what they did with the control board and paul ryan and the rest of these shysters is to kick the can down the road to keep the bonds from collapsing which could cause a contagion effect in the bond market now we're seeing that the governor the lame duck governor who's going out uh, he's defying the control board and he's telling you he's not going to cut anything and we knew that uh, this is this uh, Ale Alejandro Javier Garcia Padilla and uh, here's some of the headline here uh, Puerto Rico's governor on Monday challenged a federal control board created by Congress just months ago to oversee the finances of the US territory and help it pull out of an economic crisis in what could be a test of the board's powers governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla announced he would not submit an amended fiscal plan, the board's first request of the island's leader. He said he believes new austerity measures would only worsen the crisis and insisted the board restructure nearly $70 billion in public debt that he has said is unpayable. Quote, it's not right and it's not necessary, he said, of austerity measures. That would push us into an economic death spiral. It would mark a return of policies of depression. Board members who met in Puerto Rico for the first time last week said the 10-year plan, 10-year plan issued last month needs to be amended in part because it's not realistic and assumes federal financial help while none is likely. Hmm. They requested that Garcia submit an amended plan by December. It was not immediately clear what happens now. A board spokesman said he was checking on whether board members would comment on Garcia's announcement. A U.S. financial rescue package that created the board says the board itself can develop a fiscal plan and submit it to Puerto Rico's governor and legislature if the governor fails to do it himself. Garcia steps down as governor January 1st, but has promised to reject any austerity measures while in power. Quote, while I'm governor of Puerto Rico, I will oppose any measures such as, here we go, laying off public employees, reducing the pensions of our retirees, and leaving the University of Puerto Rico unprotected, he said. The board previously requested that some of Puerto Rico's most heavily indebted agencies submit their own fiscal plans, something that has never been required before. Government officials said at the board's meeting Friday that the agencies, including Puerto Rico's utility companies, would submit their plans. So here we go. We've got the president, the former president, saying, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to reduce our spending. I'm not going to let go of any public employees, and I'm not going to reduce anyone's pensions. So uh, now the next story here how Puerto Rico's sinking economy is crushing the American dream. This is from back in November. Not long ago, I had the opportunity to build a hotel in Old San Juan with a group of fellow entrepreneurs. We found an interested developer, but he wanted one thing, a letter from a government official that included a set of written rules that apply to building a hotel in Old San Juan. Quote, I've done projects in Puerto Rico before, he said. They change the rules whenever they feel like it. Well, isn't that what they're doing with these bondholders? It should have been easy for us to get an official to send the, us these rules. Unfortunately, we couldn't. The government officials we contacted would not provide them with the necessary 30 days. The deal fell through, and with it, the possibility of creating more than 1,000 jobs. That was two years ago. Although a federal control board is now overseeing the finances of our debt-ridden commonwealth, it can't fix the real problem that is holding back our economy. Our government simply does not embrace entrepreneurship in a way that would kickstart job creation. 
So now he's going to talk about how to fix this by using government money to uh, fund entrepreneurship. So again, uh, most of the people who live there work for the government or are on welfare. That's the reality of it. And that's the reality we're going towards. Uh, so bailout is coming. I'm telling you. Now here's the first hints of it. Here's your slimy little uh, little Marco, uh, short little Marco, that slimy little buzzard that stabbed Donald Trump in the back a million times. We know he's a rhino. He's a Republican in name only, just another socialist pretending to be a conservative. But you can see here, here's uh, just yesterday this came out. A, a nice sneaky little trick here, a backdoor bailout you can see here proposed by Marco Rubio. Want an idea of where the left would take the American economy? Look to Puerto Rico. Reports by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and Working Group for Fiscal and Economic Recovery of Puerto Rico conclude that the island's labor force has atrophied because of federally set minimum wage that is wholly inappropriate to local conditions and a safety net of government programs that makes employment a losing proposition. At $7.25 an hour, the federal minimum wage equals Puerto Rico's median wage of $9.61 versus the mainland median of $17.40. As the working group emphasizes, a Puerto Rican working for the minimum or even the median wage takes home less monthly pay than a Puerto Rican household of three might receive in welfare benefits. Only 40% of adults in Puerto Rico are officially employed or looking for work, though many hold off the books jobs. The result is a stalled economy and inadequate tax revenue for an insolvent government whose woes only make economic conditions worse. Florida Republican Senator Marco Rubio, a member of a bipartisan congressional task force on Puerto Rico, has proposed a unique approach to these challenges. He is introducing the Economic Mobility for Productive Livelihoods and Expanded Opportunity Act, Employee Act, which would effectively reduce the island's minimum hourly wage to $5. Well, that's probably a good idea. That would stimulate the economy and use a federal wage subsidy to close half the gap between the wage paid by an employer and a target wage of $10 per an hour. So here you go, here's the backdoor bailout. Thus, a minimum wage earner at the new $5 minimum would receive an additional $2.50 from the government, inserted into every paycheck like a reverse tax, payroll tax for a total hourly wage of $7.50. Someone paid $8 by his employer would receive a $1 subsidy and take home $9. The proposal is creative, compassionate, and market-based tool. No, that's not a market-based tool. <laughs> Having the government, our government, the U.S. government's taxpayer money being used to subsidize an overly high minimum wage in Puerto Rico is not a market-based solution. So there you go. There's the beginning. I've been telling you for the longest time. Uh, that without a bailout, Puerto Rico will go into a catastrophic collapse. Everyone there either works for the government or is on welfare. That's the reality. Uh, the only way to turn it around would be to absolutely fire 75% of those people, get rid of welfare, and uh, just go to a free market economy, and it would be a gut-wrenching collapse, and uh, they're not going to do it. Uh, so that is what is happening in Puerto Rico. We know that that is what is coming to the U.S. The situation is heading in the same direction. Uh, socialism is bankrupting our economy, and uh, they don't intend to do anything about it but kick the can down the road. That's exactly what they did in Puerto Rico. So back to the chart here. Uh, definitely based on the gold-silver ratio, there's no question that stacking silver at this point is a better deal, regardless of direction. I personally think there's going to be some downside, and we may do a repeat of 2016, get a big up move uh, when the new year comes in. But uh, even if that's not the case, the downside in silver is a lot less than the downside in gold. And we'll talk to you next time.